Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so in this talk, I would like to, um, to take an interspecies perspective on human well-being. And by briefly introducing the concept of animal-computer interaction and showing you through three example projects um, how by supporting, um, how by supporting animals, ACI can actually also support humans and their health. So before I, need, that before I begin, I need to do a bit of housekeeping. So um, nobody has paid me to give talks, but related expenses have been covered by universe, my university and those who have invited me. Nobody has paid me to give advice. This research has been funded by the, um, oh, by the, 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 the institutions that you see um, on the screens. And um, some partners, collaborators have also contributed in kind. And also the Open University is the one that has always sponsored my attendance to conferences. So now um, I can begin. So um, animals, um, although animals have interacted with technology for well over half a century, it is only in recent years that interaction designers, so those who design interactive systems, um, have started to take an interest in these interactions and ask questions around them. So for example, how does biotelemetry impact the uh, animal's well-being? How do in interactive ambient installations influence their social uh, dynamics? How good is the usability of interfaces such as these and, and is the interface getting in the way of the tasks that they are supposed to support and to enable? So how does the design of interface, interfaces such as these ones provide a good experience for the user? How do self-quantifying applications affect animals' security and even privacy? Are these questions that we ought to ask ourselves? And are our human environments supportive enough of animals who are tasked with specific jobs? How can we design interactive technology that provides them with the best possible support for their work that they do? So this is the kind of questions that the emerging discipline of animal-computer interaction aims to address. And the Open University's Animal Computer Interaction Lab was founded precisely to investigate these questions. So in particular, our aim is to research the interaction between animals and technology within their arbitral context in which these inter interactions may occur, to design a computing technology that gives animals better lives, supports animals in whatever tasks they might have, and fosters intra- and interspecies relationships, including human-animal relationships. And crucially, our aim is to inform user-centered approaches to the development of technology um, intended for and developed with animals, enabling them to actively participate in the design process. So just to be clear, our work is informed by a strict ethics protocol to ensure that the welfare and autonomy of the animals we work with remains our priority at all times. So, now, um, the concept of user-centered design is the foundation of interaction design as a discipline. So the process comprises specific phases and activities. First, one is to elicit requirements based on the sensorial, cognitive, and physical characteristics of the, prospect, uh, of the prospective user. And then one needs to develop alternative designs that would meet these, these requirements so that they can be uh, discussed and assessed and then can be prototyped. And the prototyping is critical so that these designs can be evaluated. And this is an iterative process that goes on and on until, until we get to a good, satisfactory uh, result. And the key thing is that part of, th throughout this whole process, the user is, um, is involved to make sure that the requirements of the users remain always at the forefront of the process and are therefore met. Now, of course, implementing the process such as this with animals, with other than humans, it could be quite challenging, 
par partly because we cannot communicate with animals as we would communicate with other humans, or at least some of them. And, um, and also because there are some fundamental differences um, as well as similarities between species, which for us might be difficult to understand. You know, it must take us a long time to un actually get to, get to them and understand how they impact the design process. So the methodological aspects of this research are also very much our interest um, because we find that they are challenging, but they're also very interesting and they can lead to, to some significant innovation in the way we approach the design of interactive systems. Now, we have a range of projects in our, in our, at our lab, but I would like today um, to focus on three projects which are uh, most, I think, most relevant for this forum. And so these are um, to do with supporting the work of assistance dogs, and, t and, and namely physical assistance dogs, and bio so medical alert dogs, and cancer detection dogs. Um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is with a collaboration of UK charity Dogs for the Disabled, which trains mobility assistance dogs to help humans, part, their human partners with daily physical tasks, such as opening doors, operating light switches, washing machines, elevators, traffic light, uh, lights, and so on. Now, um, typically, um, what you see there is the, uh, sorry, uh, is the kind of um, interfaces that mobility assistance dog, dogs have to negotiate. But as you can imagine, these devices are designed for humans, not for dogs. And dogs do struggle with them. They do struggle to learn how to engage with them, and they do struggle then to execute the tasks once they have learned it. So we are, what we are trying to do is to rethink the way in which these devices are designed um, to make them um, dog friendly and therefore accessible to them. Now, I wanted, through this talk, I would like to also uh, um, to, I would like to share, to, to put forward some of the principles and approaches that are key in interaction design and how we are trying to adapt those to working with animals. So in interaction design, there are some fundamental principles that a good interaction design will have to always take into account. Um, and so, Unfortunately, the technology that animals, the assistance dogs, uh, find themselves using every day uh, managed to break just about all of these principles. So, for example, um, visibility, visibility or per perceivability is a, a key principle. So if you can't see a control, you can't operate it. So no chance. Now, um, so that visibility needs to dictate what the, how the control is designed. But dogs, this is a traffic light example, but you know, you find alarm buttons that are red and opening buttons, you know, door opening buttons that are green. Unfortunately, because dogs are have a diachromatic vision, they cannot see red or green. Um, and so if you, if you put them in a situation where they have to choose, that is, that is a challenge for them. Um, so another issue, that another fundamental principle in, their inter in design is consistency. So the, you know, the shape and the position, for example, of things that have the same controls that have the same function should always stay the same. Otherwise, it gets confusing. Now, this is even more important for dogs because compared to humans, they don't have quite the same abilities of abstraction. So something that looks different really is something different. So. Um, However, our domestic environment, so just so that this is a small collection of light switches that presents an awful lot of inconsistencies from a dog's perspective. Now, another key principle in interaction design or in design in general is affordance. So the shape and structure of objects or you know, interactive controls should somehow suggest the way in which they are supposed to be used. And, um, and this, you know, this relates very much to the ergonomic characteristics of the user. So um, now, here's a door handle, and I challenge you to find the way in which this affords a dog being opened. Um, right. So how can we map these good design principles onto the characteristics of canine users? That's our big question. So well, 
if we do very simple mapping here, so while we might use green and red preferentially for some controls in our, in our environments, well, for dogs, we would need to use colors that they can actually see, such as, um, and discriminate between such as yellow and blue. So while we humans tend to uh, categorize things based on shape, rather, you know, dogs tend to prefer um, to categorize things based on size. So if we have to choose how to distinguish between certain different controls, perhaps we can use size as a parameter. And of course, we have to take into account that the body of human, the, of dog is different to that of humans. Dogs don't have fingers, so don't give them tiny, tiny, fiddly switches that they are supposed to then efficiently operate. Um, so here is an example of um, two different sets of controls. On the, um, on the left, these are typical controls you might find in a human home, and there is also a door knob just for, you know, for, um, just to show you. Um, the, uh, on the opposite side, on the, on the right-hand side, you have the same controls. These are the same controls, but they are designed for dogs. So at the top ones are light switches. The lights are above all the pictures, so you can't see them. And the bottom ones are door opening controls. So the, first of all, the controls are quite sizable, so they're easy to target. They are, um, wherever you touch them, they work, so the dog doesn't have to target a specific point. They're soft to detach, so they can be used with um, either the paws, which is not a very natural way of dogs for dogs to interact, or with their nose. The, the door opening systems are not actually on the door, but they are off the door, because the dog, the, so the dog doesn't get the door in his face when he tries to open it. So here are ways in which the dogs at, um, this is from an exhibition that we gave at the Royal Society Summer Science, Exhibi uh, Summer Science Exhibition in uh, this past summer, 2014. And, um, and that's, how, you know, that's how the dogs can interact uh, with them. See, these dogs can use both paws, which is actually easier for them to go on the one switch. And here, this is, this is a picture from the exhibition. This was just to, just to show you the difference. It takes a long time to train a dog to use a, a, like a, a successfully a light switch. This dog was a visitor with his human um, to, the, to the exhibition. And the human told, told the dog, just do this. And the dog immediately was able to operate, to operate the switch with no training. He's never, he had never seen this before. So that goes to show, well, thinking about design, the difference it can make. Now, something, uh, something that I'm looking forward to is that we are currently installing these devices, these controls, in one of our buildings because there is a, a, a student with her assistance dog, and the dog is struggling, surprise, surprise, to actually access the building. Um, so we are installing those new controls there, but what I am curious to see, what a study that what we are planning, is to see whether humans start using the, the dog controls uh, as opposed to the human controls. And that would tell us something about accessibility in general, for humans as well as dogs, and how we can, how improving accessibility for other animals can actually improve accessibility for humans as well. Um, now, this is another project, um, and it is about empowering medical alert dogs in emergencies. This project is in collaboration with UK charity Medical Detection Dogs, and is the work of our PhD, one of our PhD students, Charlotte Robinson. So, um, medical detection dogs trains diabetes alert dogs to detect the signs of hypoglycemia before this reaches critical point. To alert his human, the dog might paw at them um, or sniff their mouth where they detect breath odor that indicates the change in the blood composition. Now, unfortunately, some cases of diabetes are so brittle that the dog does alert, but the person has no time to respond to the alert and so take some sugar or do whatever would prevent the critical point to uh, arrive. So the person passes out, and at that point, the dog is powerless. If the dog is alone with the human, there's nothing more the dog can do. 
and that is dangerous for the human and also very distressing for the dog because these dogs are very strongly bonded to the person. So what we wanted to do was to design some kind of alarm that would allow the dogs to call for help remotely and get somebody to come and help. Now, here we had a different situation from the previous scenario. So whereas with mobility assistance dogs, the dogs, the dogs engage with the technology under the guidance of the human. The human says, touch this, do this, and most of the time. So here we have a different situation. Here we have an incapacitated human, which could be cognitively incapacitated, it could be out of the picture altogether. And so we need to make sure the dog can interact with the technology autonomously. And so it needs to figure out the situation, how do I, and how, what do I do, and how do I do it? So that poses an extra challenge on the design process. Now, again, to go back to good interaction design practice, so interaction designers usually work towards core usability goals. So these are things that make interactive systems work well. Um, so um, we, we knew that the, this alarm would have to be safe, especially safe for the dog to use, efficient, um, and it would have, be easy to, would have to be easy to learn for the dog and easy to remember how to use when he goes there and he, you know, nobody, can guide, nobody can guide him. Now, interaction designers usually also work towards developing good user experiences, and so something is enjoyable, entertaining, stimulating to interact with. However, in our case, we didn't want the, this to be either obviously not a negative experience, but we didn't want it to be too exciting an experience because we wanted the dog to only engage when it was necessary. So how should this, design, should this alarm be designed? Now, in to, to eliminate signaling ambiguities, Search and rescue practices introdu had introduced the use of sausage-like objects called bringsels. So the bringsel would hang from the dog's collar when he goes to search for you know, stranded humans, and he would only put it in his mouth and go back to his handler when he's found somebody. So the handler knows that that absolutely means there is somebody that the dog has found, and he goes with them, with the dog, to find him. So we thought, okay, we can use this perhaps as an interface, as an input device for the dog. So we, um, it is ergonomically appropriate, so that makes it efficient and effective to use. And it is already part of existing practices because in some cases also diabetes alert dogs are taught how to use it brings them. And so that will make it, um, that will make it also easy perhaps to learn and to remember, which is a very important usability goal in this case. So here is what we thought. So we thought, okay, we can have a device like this. Well, obviously we have to protect. We have to protect the electronic module from the mouth of the dog because that wouldn't last long. And so we, perhaps we can separate that. We have like an electronic component separately. Then we need somebody that connects the electronic component to the part that the dog interacts with. And so um, we can have you know, um, a trigger and we can have this sausage-like bringsel thing device. Now, we still had to answer a number of questions relating to this composition. Um, so for example, what would trigger, what would be the signal that tells the dog that he needs to now escalate from, from pawing and sniffing the person to go and get the alarm working? And uh, perhaps that might be the person passing out. That might be the trigger. So what, should, what uh, should be the size and shape of this canine input device to make sure that it is you know, the quickest, the easiest, you know, and the potentially most successful interaction? And um, so earlier, I'm, I showed the principle of feedback, but I didn't really talk about it. But actually, that is a very important design principle, because when I interact with the system, I want to know that I have accomplished the task that I've done. I've been successful um, in my interaction. So how do we communicate to the dog that he has successfully triggered the alarm so he doesn't need to, you know, he can stop uh, trying to interact with it? And, and so, um, so what, sort of, what, should, what, what sort of feedback should, should, we, should we provide? And then, is it important for the dog to actually understand the relation between the feedback and the outcome? So when the system tells you, yes, okay, alarm triggered, you can go, is it important for the dog to understand that actually that means that help is coming shortly? 
because there is a time lapse, of course. So to address these questions, figure out, I'll, you, you might remember the diagram I showed before with the design cycle. So we had to adapt that to working with dogs. And so in order to do that, what we did, we used an approach called rapid prototyping, which means to create very quick and dirty prototypes and show them to the user, get feedback quickly, modify them, do again, and over and over and over. This is a much more agile process, and it works well with, to work with users who cannot speak to us. So these are some initial quick and dirty prototypes. You might recognize at the top the wooden block, which represented the electronic module. There were some connectors of different types, and there were different types of, you know, of sort of sausage-like uh, device that would be the substitute for the bring, the bring. So we did it so we could quickly permutate um, different combinations and try over and over with the dogs to see what worked better for them. Now, I have some videos here. I'm not sure. It seemed to have some problems when we put it here before. Well, I'll see if, if it works. This is a training session just to show you how that works. So the person pretending to faint, this is her, her uh, assistant's dog. Her, sorry, diabetes led dog. So the dog is being encouraged to go to where the alarm, substitute alarm is, and, and pull the trigger. Okay. Now here's another, um, another clip. There is a slight change here. The person goes further away from, the, uh, from the, where the trigger is and goes behind the corner. And so let's see what happens. So the dog is having difficulty this time, going all the way, going to the alarm, and, and it seems, you know, confused, and then... There, and then he finally sits up, gives up, and he starts panting and, and, um, and yawning, which are signs of stress. Okay, so he's, he's, he's feels helpless. So now the conclusion here, the researcher and the trainees were that because, because, these, um, because the, the person was further away, the alarm was around the corner from the person, the dog was less able or less willing to engage. So that told us that we perhaps, for that particular dog, we might have to, divide, to take a different approach and perhaps develop something that was wearable on the person. So the dog wouldn't have to leave the person in order to go and trigger the alarm. Now here is another quick, um, just another quick clip to show you a different stage, more advanced stage of the, of the training with a different dog and what the dog does, what the protocol then became for. So the person has passed out, the dog sneaks around her, goes quickly, get the, get the, triggers the alarm and takes back, um, takes it back to the person. And that was the whole choreography, so to speak. Now this is the last, the latest version of the, of our, of the prototype. So there is light to let the human know that it's working. There is actually a, a speaker to let the person know that it's been triggered and there is a button to override the alarm in case it was triggered by mistake. But here at the bottom you see there is a, we realized that in order to communicate clearly to the dog that they, he had triggered the alarm, the thing needed to come off, as you see before, I forgot to say. But you know, that was the one very unambiguous trigger, very unambiguous signal for the dog that he has done, had done the task. Now here we have, for perhaps different stages of the training or for different individual dogs, we, have, we can change the, 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 the device that she, the dog interacts with, the element that the dog interacts with. So this is um, just to show you that we are currently deploying some of these, um, some of these devices in some of the charities' clients um, for home trials. So now I have the... Last project that I wanted to tell you about is, to, is in, still in collaboration with the medical detection dogs and is to support the work of cancer detection dogs and in particular the communication process with the handler. 
So we know that early diagnosis can vastly improve can cancer prognosis, prognosis, but unfortunately some comparative com cancers can be difficult to diagnose. For example, the PSA um, blood test typically used to, you know, in this, in, in, um, in, to, to diagnose prostate cancer can result um, on up, up to 75% false positives. And while needle biopsy is more accurate, it's still um, not uh, too accurate, and it also carries risks of infection and contamination. So as a form of secondary screening, um, and a non-invasive one, non-invasive for humans, the medical detection of dogs is, is, has been pioneering the training of dogs to recognize organ, organic volatile compounds from, uh, cancer, from cancer cells in biological samples such as urine, sweat, or breath. Dogs have an extremely accurate olfactory apparatus, as we might have guessed from the previous project, um, which is many thousands of times superior to that of humans. But here we are talking a lower threshold than in the, in the case of diabetes alone. So indeed, since 2004, a series of controlled clinical trials has shown that with appropriate training protocols, the dog can achieve a detection accuracy of up to 90%. So how does cancer detection with dogs work? So, uh, the working apparatus may consist of a lineup of stands or a carousel. Each support holds a steel arm with a perforated plate at the end, behind which is a tube containing the sample. Typically, the lineup or carousel will present one positive sample and four to six control samples, which the dog investigates one at a time. Now, to communicate positive feedback to the dog, the trainer uses a sound, um, the sound of a clicker associated with the reward. I'm saying these details because these are important for understanding some of the things later. Now, the training process com consists fundamentally of two parts. Firstly, the dog is taught to recognize the odor of positive samples as salient, and this is called a stimulus response. Secondly, in order to communicate to the trainer what they have found, the dog is taught to use um, a conventional, conventional signals, such as, for example, sitting down in front of a positive sample or coming away from a negative sample. And this is called operant response. Now, the operant conventions that the dogs um, need to use for the benefit of humans present at least two limitations. Firstly, uh, they only allow the dog to say, yes, there's something here, or no, there's nothing here, but no nuances in between, which might actually be important, because not all positive samples might be positive in the same way. And secondly, the dogs have to communicate using a language which is not their own, um, which interferes with their detection work, thus reducing the reliability of their response, especially at, thro at low thresholds. So here, to illustrate these issues, I'm going to show you uh, three example patterns seen from above. So this is called the head flick, and here's what one of the trainers says about it. So the dog has an appropriate stimulus response to the sample, but is in automatic operant mode, you know, stay or go, stay or go. And so he moves away too quickly, only to realize that he needs to go back. It is difficult for the trainer to spot the stimulus response before the dog moves, moves on and give timely feedback, which is critical to let the dog know whether he's correct. If the feedback is not timely, it could cause a lot of damage to the training process. So this, is, this other pattern is called displaced alert. So the dog recognizes the sample but moves to the next stand and signal in front of that one instead as though he had forgotten that he needed to, sign, to signal. The trainer cannot see the stimulus response because it is too subtle, and at the same time cannot reward a displaced operant response, even if he knows what the dog meant, because that would give the dog the wrong message. So finally, this pattern is called look back. So the dog may look back at the trainer when neither of his signaling options reflect what he, um, he finds on the, in the sample, and therefore he's unsure what to do. Also, if he's not confident enough, he might look back uh, to the trainer looking for inadvertent signs coming from, from, from the trainer. 
So to address these issues, we wanted to develop an interactive device that would allow the dogs to communicate with the humans in an easier and more nuanced way. Now, our first concept was to provide the dog with a simple keyboard, which they could use with their paws to say yes, no, or maybe. However, we discounted that almost immediately because um, that, would, that training for more than binary um, response would have been even more difficult. And also, as, um, as I sort of quickly mentioned before, that actually poor interaction is not the most dog friendly. So our second uh, concept was um, to provide the dog with a graduated scale uh, that they could interact with, with using their nose. And we would only train for yes or no and allow the dog to perhaps spontaneously use uh, options in between if they felt that neither or, or, you know, the extremes were adequate. But that had a major flaw because it assumed that we, the dogs would order and quantify, you know, and, and classify quantities in the same way that we might. And so we checked that out of the window as well. Then we thought, okay, maybe we could provide just one pressure pad next to the, you know, the, the sort of the, the plate, the, the sniffing plate. And the dog can, when is the response is negative, the dog just moves away. And when it's positive, the dog uses the pad, but he can use different amounts of pressure to sort of modulate his response. And in a spontaneous way, and we'll see what, um, or, you know, what, uh, so no, that was to tr training to use different amounts of pressure. But again, that has, has a still an operant component, which wasn't ideal. Um, and also the dog, in order to signal, he would have to move away from the sample. And we thought that that might also be problematic. So finally, we realized that um, in order not to disrupt the screening process, we needed to integrate the signaling device with the detection apparatus. And in order to eliminate the operant component, we needed to enable a form of interaction that was completely spontaneous. In other words, we needed to recenter the interaction on the dogs themselves and shift the, tra the, the translation sort of burden from the dogs to the system. So this is what we did. So we hypothesized that the pressure patterns that the dog spontaneously exerted when sniffing, investigating a sample, would in some way correlate to the sample's content. And to explore this, we built the steel rig that you see there. So there was, um, we pivoted the steel arm that held the plate at the end so that this could give way when the dog sniffed and so we could record the pressure. We put another arm we put another arm at the bottom that, uh, that held the uh, a pressure sensor, the, the red thing you see there, at the bottom of the steel arm uh, to record, to maintain the angle, angles constant, but to record the movements um, of the plate under the pressure of the dog's nose. Now, this seemed like a, con that, like a promising concept, but the design needed to undergo several iterations to address some issues because there was a lot of noise in the way. So for example, we needed to counterweight the, um, the, um, um, the weight of the arm on the sensor to make sure that the whole range of amplitude could be used by the dog and the sensor would go back when the dog came away. And also we needed to stabilize the frame because some dogs were so energetic that they would push the frame forward and that would disperse energy that we wanted we wanted to record in term, as a signal and then we also needed to fine tune this the res software resolution to be able to pick up bigger movements as well as my minute ones so here is a little video to show you examples of what happens Okay, so this, here the dog was using a single stand uh, to begin with, and this was his, his behavior to a negative sample. Now, I'll show you another one. Okay, and that's the dog signaling to a positive sample. Now, so these are graphs that produced by the dogs. So, um, 
So this is an example of pressure patterns from the screening of three different samples. So the dog screened these three samples repeatedly in a random order during different sessions with similar patterns recurring for the same samples. So the graph on the left is the dog screening a negative sample. We only have one main peak and a narrow curve, so the dog quickly dismisses the sample and then moves on. The graph on the right is the dog screening a positive sample. So we have three main peaks. Well, one at the center is limited by our, um, the amplitude we had to work with, but it would have been higher. But, um, so we have three main peaks, and the overall um, width of the curve is much, is much wider. So the dog goes in repeatedly and energetically showing a lot of interest. Now, finally, the graph in the middle is the dog screening a sample that, had, that humans had classified as negative. And, but here is where the dog might be picking up on something that we don't know about and that we should find out. So here is another as example, because I wanted to show you that, of course, it different, so each dog is different, and each dog will respond and interact differently with different samples. Plus, if we begin to add more stands, that also complicates things due to the greater variation in the angle from which the dogs might approach the stands. So I'll show you this example. Um, so this is a lineup of three. This, the positive sample has been placed in the middle, um, in the middle stand. So this is a very exuberant dog, and, the kind of and this is the kind of graphs he produces. So the one on the left in pink is his response to a negative sample, and all that stuff in red on the, le on the right is his response to the positive sample. Um, now I'll show you another uh, with a very different dog. Okay. So this dog has a much lighter touch, and the graphs he's produce, he produces are very different from the previous one, from the previous dog. Nevertheless, it is, you know, there's still a distinctive difference between negative in pink and positive in red. So our next step is now to develop algorithms that can allow the system to calibrate to different dogs and different setups, because what we don't want to do is to get the dogs to adapt to our systems. It has to be the other way around. The dog needs to do what a dog does, and then it is up to us to adapt the system to make sure the dog can work at the best of his, of his uh, performance. Now, um, so the main point that I wanted to make with this project is that this approach could be the way that in which um, of best supporting the dog's spontaneous interaction with the samples, which has the potential to enable greater subtlety and reliability in their signaling capabilities. Additionally, the process computation that we're trying to do has the potential to enable the emerger or emergence of a user-centered scent detection language for individual dogs. Now, in effect, what the system does is to support honest signaling. So honest signals, um, which recur in, human in, in animal communications, including humans, are behavioral signs that are difficult to fake or suppress, and we, that is why they are reliable. So the dog's stimulus response to a sample is an honest signal, and we, that is why it is, is a reliable indicator of his interest in the signal. Now, in humans, honest signals might be subtle gestures, postures, and movements that express subconscious responses to a situation. Now, if we think of a doctor who is examining CT scans of a patient looking for signs of illness, and perhaps using his touch and gestures to manipulate and maybe sort different images, now, there are different approaches to possibly support these tasks. One approach, which is prevalent in interaction design, is to support the task by, um, by touch, sort of using touch screen gesture interfaces, but where the interaction model is grounded in human gestural conventions. 
So what happens is that the, what the interface um, does, it is designed to try and cope with subtle individual deviations from those conventions. So for example, if minor differences in a tap or minor differences in a swipe, so the system is, tr is tries to, um, to neutralize, to ignore those deviations, to try and reconduct the interaction to patterns that the system knows. Now, another approach could be to use an in, a, a different interaction model, which actually capitalizes on minor deviations instead of ignoring them. So, and this might be desirable, not just for dogs, but also for humans for certain tasks. So particularly tasks in which minor deviations might be honest indicator, indicators of stimulus responses expressing implicit knowledge, which might be critically important to capture. So a more hesitant swipe, for example, might not be just a random variation, but a meaningful expression of something the user sub subconsciously pick, picks up on. So the, you know, then what was sort of I suggest is that actually interaction models based on a signaling input are worth investigating, but do in a, you know, in a crop from a cross species perspective, because perhaps there's something we can learn going back and forth. So that, um, with that, I thank you for listening. And I, you know, I hope that, <laughs> that um, what I said might have somehow might connect with, with, um, the themes that you are all interested in. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic. <laughs>